Good evening. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so worse than it was before. <laughs> if you're if I didn't speak to you before service, now you know why. So let's just get it out of the way. This is my voice tonight. Been fighting a head cold all week long. My family's been sick. This is just how I sound. So you better like it. Just get used to it. So if my voice cracks, if it breaks, whatever, you can laugh. But let's be adults and then just move right past it, okay? So welcome to Refuge. <clears throat> Man, has anybody ever seen uh, Emperor's New Groove where Isma turns into the cat and she's like, is that my voice? This is much worse than it was before rehearsal. I'm so sorry. So that means it's going to be a quick message tonight. So let's get started. Today is December 2nd. And we have officially left behind all that is Thanksgiving and all that is fall. And we begin our countdown to Christmas. Some of us have been, I'm not, it's not some of us, some people have been counting down since July. You know, you have that one friend on Facebook who's like, there's 156 days until Christmas. And you're like, man, I could get my Christmas shopping done now. And then it's December 2nd and you've done no Christmas shopping except for your Christmas angel. But, um, so, and even our church has transformed. I want to say a quick thank you to everyone who came out last week to help get this church decorated. I had no plan. I had no, like, no structure. People came in and they're like, what do you want me to do? I was like, these are the decorations. Here's a picture. Have fun. And people just, they came in, they put stuff up. And we're doing an advent, and I had a really cool, cool idea where we'd turn each of these boards around each week. But the OCD people in the church are like, why are they backwards? They're backwards. They shouldn't be back. So it might not, might not work. It might not work out that way I wanted it to. But thank you to everyone who came. I really, really appreciate it. If you weren't here for decorating last week, you're dead to me. So <laughs> just kidding. And then the next line on my notes is, in the interest of making the nice list this year, um, I want to be honest with you guys. Since I was about 24, 25, not been a fan of Christmas. Not my favorite holiday. If you're in the Facebook group, you know I said Easter has better candy, Thanksgiving has better food, and Halloween has better outfits. But since I was like mid-20s, I haven't been a fan of Christmas, and not like in like the Grinch or the Scrooge where I want to ruin everybody's Christmas, but just kind of more pretentious, like I'm too good for it, like, you know, like the Christians who don't drink alcohol and make the Christians who do feel really bad. That's kind of how I am with Christmas. Oh, you celebrate Christmas? <laughs> good for you. That's how I feel about Christmas, and I don't know if it's the Christmas music. Look, I hate Christmas music. I hate it so much. I I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's because I had to grow up playing it. And look, I can play the guitar, but I am no Presley Culbertson. So if the song is an F or E flat, or there's 10 chord changes in a four beat measure, I can't do it. Can't do it, won't do it. And can we stop singing Let It Snow in Florida? Like, come on. Like, we can get into the Christmas spirit without Let It Snow in Florida, right? One time when I was a worship pastor in Ohio, well, the only Christmas Eve I was up there, I did uh, Silent Night on the guitar, and I practiced and practiced and practiced, and it was the best I'd ever played Silent Night. And some people gave me, like, really backhanded compliments, like, hey, that was great, but it would have been better on the piano. It's like, thanks. So there's, so that leads me into the expectations. I don't like the expectations we put on Christmas. As a ministry leader, a ministry volunteer, there's rehearsals, there's services. And then I always, I put the expectation on myself to try and make my mom cry every year with the gift I give, here, give her. One year I wrote her a song and recorded it, cried like a baby. Perfect. I have not yet lived up to that, but my goal every year is to make my mom cry. But there's expectations we put on Christmas. We got to buy this. We got to cook that, bake this, Christmas party here, white elephant here. Expectation after expectation after obligation. And it seems like the expectation is just to stay busy during the Christmas season. From mid-December to December 25th until you get to that weird dark hole that is Christmas to New Year's. It's an expectation to just stay busy. And I can make a really good case that I don't like Christmas and I don't like all the busyness and I don't like the hubbub because it's detrimental to our mental health. Like the future therapist in me is like, it's practicing self-care is why I don't like Christmas. But one of my very few flaws 
Yeah, that's a joke. That's a joke. I got a lot of them. <laughs> One of my flaws is waiting for people to laugh. One of... <laughs> Excuse me. One of my ma many flaws is that, and I don't know if there's anybody in the room who will agree with me on this, is that if you ask me to do something that I intended to do anyways, I get salty and not want to do it. Is that just a me thing or could just be a me thing? But I'm only human. Thank you, God, for grace. So what I'm saying is that I probably don't like Christmas is because you want me to like Christmas. So I'm not going to do it. So imagine... You're getting ready to throw a Christmas party, and you go through all the Christmas things, the cooking, the shopping, the baking, the decorating, the cleaning, the wrapping, the caroling, the gifting, the roasting, and the toasting, and you go through all of it, all the chaos that comes with Christmas, but you forget to actually prepare for your guests. In the busyness of the Christmas season, we tie our heart and our mind into knots with every stressor, every expectation, every frustration, every impatience. And our goal with the Advent season this year, with our Advent series, is to help create a space for you to sit with the Lord and to slowly untie the knots of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your life. Our goal with this series is to pause, to breathe, to reflect, to meditate on the story of Christmas and the love and the hope and the joy and the peace that is Jesus Christ. So what is Advent? When I say the word Advent, what are some things that come to mind? Just shout them out because I'm going to take a sip of water. Chocolate, countdown, calendar, Yes, and that's exactly, that's simply all that Advent is. It's a, count, it's a countdown, you know, we get our little tiny little doors and our little trinkets, but it's a four-week season, a four-week countdown um, on the church calendar, calendar that's dedicated to the waiting of the, and the anticipation of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, and it's simply what Advent means is the arrival and so Advent is not a tradition or anything that I observed growing up. We didn't even do the little Advent calendars in my house. It wasn't until that I was reconstructing my faith that I really, I really even cared to explore the liturgical things. So I just said a big church word, liturgical. If you don't know what the word means, don't worry. I didn't know what it meant until a couple of years ago. But it's just a big, fancy church word that we use when we're referring to rituals or practices or observances within Christian denominations. A liturgical calendar is often followed by Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, the United Church of Christ, and it sounds stuffy and ritual ritualistic, and that's what I thought for many years, so I didn't care to um, explore it. I didn't care to learn about it. I was like, that's what religious weird people do. I don't need to know anything about that. But when you get to the heart of the reason why this calendar is followed, why the reason why churches follow a liturgical calendar and they practice Advent and things like Lent, it, it is designed to make you pause and stop. And it's really quite beautiful because it makes you reflect on the season. It makes you reflect on why we celebrate those things. And it comes down to Jesus and my redefining and my rediscovering God I begin to look at some of these rituals and practices in a new light. Yes, capitalism in the church and humanity has detracted from the sanctity of the Advent countdown. Chocolate calendars, there's a Hot Wheels calendar. Look, I'm, my kid is not doing that this year. He gets enough. We're just going to do the little gingerbread man up the ladder, and that's, that's, all, that's, gonna, that's all that we're going to do. But Advent is meant to, in a season of chaos and busyness, make us slow down, make us pause, and make us even say, thank you, God, when busy and hurry and rushed is the default mode. I was talking to my mom on the phone today, and she says she feels rushed and overwhelmed, and I'm like, well, why? She says, it's December 2nd, and I don't even have my Christmas tree up. And I was like, look, we're not all David and Adrian. We just we're not all gonna live up to that I said 
just go home, rest. We'll come over tomorrow and put your tree up. The third is fine. The third of December is fine to put your tree up because we all know she's going to leave it up until Valentine's Day anyways. So in my preparation for this series, I read something that really kind of struck me. It says the Advent season is all about reflecting on how we can prepare our hearts and homes for Christ's birth in the world as it is today. In the world as it is today. Preparing our hearts, our minds, our souls as if Jesus Christ was born into this moment in history in 2023. And it's kind of interesting to think about it that way and keep that in mind as we talk about love tonight. So we've got the what and the why of Advent, you know, a four-week season. We pause, we slow down, we meditate, you keep repeating yourself, Nicole. So what, so how do we celebrate Advent? You can do it by counting down. And like we've mentioned, there are four themes of Advent. We're going to be celebrating these four themes the next four weeks, and we're going to we're going to go through them each week, and then we're going to uh, go through them on Christmas Eve, and we're even going to light candles on Christmas Eve. But the themes of Advent are hope, love, joy, and peace. Some churches and denominations swap out love for faith, but refuge, we're doing love instead. And they swap out the order, and we're also swapping the order because, you know, we're misfits. We don't do anything normal. But um, the reason we're doing that, why are we starting with love? Why are we doing love? Is that because we believe that love is the most important thing. And we're starting with love. I was supposed to preach love next week. I'm preaching love because the pastor who was supposed to preach on hope tonight had a previous engagement, and on Tuesday was like, hey, Nicole, I need you to preach on Saturday. Are you cool with that? And I was like, sure. Then on Wednesday, I wake up with a head cold, and then I was like, there's nothing I can do about it now. So we're starting with love. And, and love, like I said, is the most important thing. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 here, verses 1 through 7. I know that we know this. It was probably read at some of your weddings, but let's read it together. To, well, I'm going to read it. You don't have to read it out loud. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes and always perseveres. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the most important thing. Without love, our hope, faith, peace, joy is meaningless. Without love, everything is meaningless. And the kind of love talked about here in 1 Corinthians 13 is a choice, a choice to make the well-being of other people a priority. Like, I make a choice that when my kid and I both want the last chicken nugget. I give it to him because I choose to love him. Love is choosing to fill the food pantry. Love is choosing to take a Christmas angel ornament. Choosing to love is the foundation that everything else is built on. Love is the foundation that hope is built on, that joy is built on, that peace is built on. Without love, everything else leaves us empty. The love described in 1 Corinthians 13 is talked about in terms of our attitudes and our actions towards one another. And even when Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was, what does he say? Love. In Mark chapter 12, it says, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But he doesn't stop there. He says the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Love, 
love for God and love for people, equally important, were the most important things for Jesus. Without love, nothing else matters. Not my gifts, not my talents, not my times, not my giving. It's all empty. Without love, we are bankrupt. Without love, there is no hope. There is no joy. There is no peace. Love is the most important. If you've been around long enough to hear me preach, you know that I love a good word study. I love to dissect words and go back into the context and the culture, and I love to sit with dictionaries and commentaries and the sources. Did you know that the sori is an appropriate uh, plural use of the word thesaurus? Did you know that? I didn't. Chat GPT told me that this week, and I was like, "Hey, I'm learning. I'm the ever, the ever expanse of knowledge with AI." But I love to take apart words, and I could do a four-part series on the word love alone. And so I want to look at a few of of the variations of love that we get in Mark chapter 12. So when Jesus spoke the words, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself," he spoke in Aramaic. And when Jesus, um, he spoke the words in Aramaic. I'm not going to try to say it because I'm already like crackling, crackle lacking up here and I'm having a hard time. And then when it was written down by the author of Mark, it was written in Hebrew. And then when the disciples taught people, they were going out teaching the word, teaching the love and the life of Jesus, they taught in Greek. So we have three different languages, but the same word. And so I say all that's to say this, is that they did not learn the meaning of love by doing a word study because there was not Aramaic dictionaries they could refer to. There were not Hebrew dictionaries they could go back to. They didn't have Google or ChatGPT or Dictionary.com. They didn't even have a library. And I don't even think that most of the disciples of Jesus even knew how to read or write. So to learn the agape love of God, the unconditional love, they had to look at the life of Jesus, how he lived, how he treated people, how he interacted with people, Jesus's attitudes and actions towards others. That's how they taught how to love. Jesus's life being the ultimate definition of love. Jesus himself being love. Jesus is love. And we see this love in action in Jesus's life. When Jesus said in Mark 12 to love God, love your neighbor, he wasn't making up new laws. This wasn't something, a new idea or a new concept that when he was asked, he was like, oh, I got a good idea. These were laws that were already written in uh, the in the Torah, in the Jewish law. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. Sound familiar? And then Leviticus 19, 18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. So quick Old Testament lesson, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were the Pentateuch and the Torah, the Jewish law. And anybody who was anybody back in the day had these five books memorized. I want that to sink in. I'm going to say it again. They had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy memorized. Can you tell me what your partner's phone number is? I cannot. I know it starts with 941 because she's from Sarasota County, but that's about it. See, Jesus knows the laws. He has them memorized, but he puts a new spin on things. He puts a new spin on things that people already know. Our love for God is expressed by our love for people. True love is seeking out the well-being of other people without expecting anything in return. And this new idea, this new concept was set up by an ultimate standard by Jesus in Luke 35 when he says, love your enemies, do good to them. This one makes us squirm. This one makes us say, well, that might not be something Jesus really meant. But love your enemies. Do good for them. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Now, Jesus wouldn't be a big deal. And we wouldn't still be talking about him if he only said to do these things. How many times did we stop talking about people or start 
or stop following people because their actions don't match their words. But this is how Jesus lived. Jesus loved. And we celebrate Christmas because that is when love entered the world in a humble and unassuming manner. John 1, 14 says, So love became flesh and made his home among us. In other translation of the Bible, John 1, 14 says that love became flesh. But I like the New Living Translation in this idea of Jesus or love becoming a human. Because being a human being is by far the most difficult thing I've ever done in my whole life. Being a human sucks. Being a human sucks because sometimes you're just going on about your life, not expecting to preach. Then all of a sudden your boss is like, hey, I need you to preach this weekend. And it doesn't matter if you're sick or you sound like a frog. I need you to do it. (laughs) I'm going to get so fired. (laughs) Being a human sucks. My dog will do like this aggressive, like little, like sigh and growl and roll over on his back. And I just mockingly scratch his belly and say, oh, life is so hard. Don't worry, he gets the sarcasm. You might not, but Fenway does. But being a human is really, really hard. But John 1 tells us that love takes on humanity. Love takes on all of the human things that really suck. Navigating relationships with other people. Introverts, where you at? (laughs) There are people in this world who I look at and say, how can one person be so annoying? Driving in Southwest Florida makes it really hard to love other people. Emotions. Humans have emotions. We're sad. We're angry. We're happy. We grieve. We have anxiety and ADHD. And I have to figure out how to manage all of these things and still be a good person. Sucks. We have to be healthy. I used to be able to run five, six, nine, ten miles at a time. And now my 35-year-old knees are like, good luck. But somehow I have to keep my body healthy. I have to keep my mind healthy. Not only do I have bad knees, but I have anxiety and depression and ADHD. Cool. None of those things make life harder. That's sarcasm again. This is just dripping in sarcasm. I have responsibilities. Anybody have responsibilities? No, just a room full of humans without responsibilities or emotions or mental health issues. Cool. So I have to keep myself alive and keep myself healthy and manage my emotions and my mental health. But also I have to teach a tiny, fragile, little chaotic human to do the same. He, he came and cried and tried to sit in my lap because I wouldn't give him a popsicle today. After he had had one, he wanted to. And so he cried. And so I'm like, okay, dude, we can be upset that we don't get a popsicle, but this is a little overboard. So he went to his room, he cried it out, and I was like, okay, I think I'm doing something right. He comes back in, can I have a popsicle? No, man. So the list of why being a human sucks can go on and on and on and on and on. I'm sure you have your stories of how your humanity sucks. But the beauty of all of it is that love becomes human to share in this experience. My grief Love endured it. My depression, love guided me through it. My sadness, love shares it. My anger, love controls it. My anxiety, love calms it. My responsibility, love managed them. Love became human. And not just to teach us and to tell us how to live, but he lived out being human. He lived out how to manage all of these things. Love became flesh, living out how to love, how to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, how to love our neighbor as ourself, how to love our enemies. Instead of attacking his enemies, love let his enemies kill him. And this is the love of 1 Corinthians 13 that Jesus lives out Love and action. Love came down in humble beginnings. Not just to live out how we're supposed to love our enemies, our neighbors, our families, our friends. 
But the main reason that love became flesh, the main reason love became human and dwelt among us is that he came to love us. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being, born as a human, bearing all the suckiness that comes with being human. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And this is the exciting thing about Christmas. Love being made human. Love living all the human experience. The grief, the loss, the pain, the hurt, the sadness, the brokenness, the happiness, the joy, the waiting, the chaos, the harvest. Every human experience, Jesus lived it. Love endured a human life even to death on the cross. 1 John 4 says, God showed us how much he loved us. How much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. We love because he first loved us. He loved us so much that he gave up divinity for humanity, privilege for poverty. He became like us, died for us, simply because he first loved us. And this is the Christmas story. Luke 2, 6 through 7, it says, while they were there, The time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to love, her firstborn son. So she wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel. I'm going to ask the band to come up as we close out here. Luke 2, verses 10 through 11 says, But the angel reassured him, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Love Yes, love, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born in Bethlehem in the city of David. Matthew 2, 11 said that the wise men entered the house and they saw love in the arms of Mary. Overcome, they kneeled down and they worshiped him. They opened their luggage and presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Matthew 2, 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, flee to Egypt with his child and his mother. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for love to kill him. Matthew 26, 50, Jesus replied, do what you came for, my friend. Then the men stepped forward and they seized love. And arrested him. Luke 23, 34, love said, love said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 46, love called out in a loud voice, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last breath. Matthew 28, 5 through 6. Then the angel spoke to the woman, said, don't be afraid. I know you are looking for love who was crucified. He isn't here. Love is risen from the dead just as he said it would happen. Come and see where he, his body was lying. Love is what the Christmas story is about. Love is born in a manger. Love is worshiped by shepherd and wise men. Love lives a sucky life, suffering, hated, abandoned, betrayed, and arrested. Love hung on a cross. Love was forsaken in his suffering. Love conquered sin, death, and the grave. Love bridged the gap that separated us from him. And that same love is jealous for me. 
a love so pure, a love so true that wants nothing more than to just love us. Father, right now we just pause and reflect on your love. How big, how bold, how audacious that you would come in a manger, suffer the life of a human, be betrayed, be hated, be hung on a cross to die, then rise again so that you could simply love me. Would you fill this room with your love tonight, God? Would you meet us where we are? Lord, we love you and we thank you. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and worship with us as we just reflect and meditate on the love of God?